We are honored to host with UNDP the first event that opens the 27th Annual Meeting on Strengthening the Rule of Law for Sustaining Peace and Fostering Development. The quick question for this evening is, how can development promote accountability, tackle impunity, and sustain peace? Fortunately, I don't have to answer this question, but all of you will. And we have a room full of experts in this field, and I trust that you will share with us your insights and experiences on this important topic. Tonight, we have the unique opportunity to hear from leaders who ha are overcoming tremendous challenges in order to strengthen the rule of law and tackle impunity. Through their determination and courage, they're playing a key role in their countries in both restoring justice and offering hope to disenchanted populations. UNDP has played an important role in supporting these reforms in building accountable, transparent, and inclusive institutions. To learn more about UNDP's work, I will give now the floor to our co-host, Mr. Patrick Hewlers, Director of the Governance and Peace Building Cluster at the Bureau for Policy and Program Support in UNDP. Director Hewlers, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to this 2017 annual meeting on rule of law, which we start today. Um, let me first of all thank all our distinguished guests. Uh, some of them came from far to join us this week. But let me first of all convey my deep appreciation and gratitude to the International Peace Institute for hosting this first event this week. This year we focus our rule of law week actually on rule of law for sustaining peace and fostering development, a theme that we simply cannot emphasize enough. And the reason is clear. Over the recent years, we witnessed a rise in complex and multidimensional crisis and conflict, increased insecurity within and across borders, as well as an increase in intrastate conflict between armed groups with regional and international dimensions. Resolutions adopted by the Security Council and the General Assembly in 2016 have brought the language of sustaining peace to the heart of the discussions on how the UN system can concretely move forward its three pillars of peace and security, development and human rights through coherent efforts that prevent conflict, address human rights violations and advance humanitarian law. This is aligned with the comprehensive nature of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which reflects member states' recognition that peaceful, just and inclusive societies are not only a means for achieving the development agenda but a critical development goal in itself. At the core of this agenda is the principle to leave no one behind. This means that peace and development can only be achieved if people who are most vulnerable and marginalized can equitably benefit from development outcomes and see tangible peace dividends in their daily lives. In our work, we advance this principle through efforts that underline inclusion, ensuring that groups that face structural discrimination, including ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, indigenous peoples, as well as women and young people, are seen not only as beneficiaries of development, but as equal partners and agents of peace and development themselves. This principle is interlinked with our recognition that peace is durable and sustainable only if we address the root causes of conflict, including real and perceived injustices, lack of opportunity, and alienation felt by marginalized groups. Ensuring accountability for systematic violations of human rights is one means of recognizing injustices, and putting in place measures to address impunity can contribute to more lasting peace. Allow me to illustrate with a few examples of how UNDP is supporting national authorities in advancing the rule of law in these areas. In Tunisia, the Truth and Dignity Commission began holding public hearings in 2016, which enabled victims to testify of how abuses of the former dictatorship affected their lives and those of their family members. The victims came forward to shed light on the abuses they have been subjected to, from arbitrary arrests, torture, and forced disappearances, to social and professional persecution, 
to begin the process of seeking redress. UNDP has been helping to bring these voices to the front and build the foundations for sustaining a peaceful, just, and inclusive society. Respect for the rule of law and human rights is central to prevention of conflict. Strengthening institutions, including a more independent judiciary, is critical in promoting accountability and addressing impunity. In transitional contexts, usually characterized by still fragile political settlements, putting in place mechanisms to deal with past violations can help address underlying drivers of conflict and build the foundations for a more resilient and sustainable peace. In Burkina Faso and the Gambia, UNDP through the Global Focal Point and with support from the Peacebuilding Support Office has supported security sector reform and transitional justice to build on a successful political transition and address the root causes of instability. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, addressing sexual and gender-based violence through support to special units in prosecution offices has been important to improve access to justice for the most vulnerable. In addition to dealing with the past and ensuring accountability, in our work we also focus on supporting transitional justice initiatives to put in place measures to prevent future violations and recurrence of conflict. Our efforts help ensure that national legal frameworks are in line with international standards, build strong civilian oversight mechanisms, develop independent institutions and dynamic civil society organizations, including human rights defenders, all as a means for strengthening resilience and preventing conflict. In Sri Lanka, after the conflict ended in 2009, and despite major progress on human development nationwide, pockets of inequality remain along ethnic, religious, and geographical lines. These horizontal inequalities, along with heightened risks due to environmental hazards, remain potential triggers for tensions. UNDP is supporting access to justice, rule of law and human rights, including transitional justice mechanisms with a focus on guarantees of non-recurrence. Our approach focuses on people through targeted CSO engagement that ensures victim-centric processes while simultaneously strengthening oversight mechanisms like the Human Rights Commission and the National Police Commission. The connection between peace and development is highlighted as part of the Secretary General's prevention agenda, which recognizes that violent conflict undermines peace and development, and that development as an end in itself is also a means of prevention. Initiatives such as the Human Rights of Front have been instrumental as an early warning scanning of risks through a human rights, development, political, and humanitarian lens. This initiative has mobilized the UN system on joint analysis and early support for prevention on the ground. Let me conclude by once again thanking you and welcoming you to interesting discussions in this session and over the next few days, which will delve into the reality of power dynamics and explore how the rule of law is at the heart of peaceful, just and inclusive societies that we aim to achieve by 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we will hear from Mr. Amadien, Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. He will uh, be giving the opening address. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, friends, uh, I would like to start by thanking the International Peace Institute for hosting this event and UNDP for inviting me to speak. I would also like to thank you for choosing a team that is particularly timely as the Secretary General called for us to strengthen the links and cooperation between the three pillars of the UN system, peace, development, and human rights in order to better support states to prevent conflict, human rights violations, atrocity crimes, and all situations that result in large-scale human suffering. This is a topic that is close to my heart and to the work that I have dedicated my life to. It is also directly linked to my mandate as the Special Advisor of the Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, 
SDG 16 sets the framework for this discussion with its objective to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. We know that in all societies, but particularly in societies that have been ravaged by conflict or other forms of crisis, the achievement of this goal must start with a frank assessment of each country's strengths and weaknesses and the development of programs that are tailored to respond to this assessment. In particular, states emerging from conflict must deal first with the past in order to build the future. It is not possible to achieve sustainable peace without first taking an objective and clear eye look at the root causes of past crises and making a genuine commitment to address them. We have seen that the failure to deal adequately with the past increases the likelihood of renewed instability and violence. In particular, an analysis of past cases has shown that societies that have a history of violence and serious violations of international human rights and humanitarian law or atrocity crimes can be more prone to renew episodes of violence and atrocity crimes. This is particularly true where the legacies of past violence and atrocity crimes have not been adequately addressed through individual criminal accountability, reparation, truth-seeking, and reconciliation processes, as well as comprehensive reform measures in the security and judicial sectors. Violent conflict and atrocity crimes leave terrible scars on societies. History has shown that for societies to heal, there has to be a transitional justice process, a process that links an objective examination of what occurred, i.e. truth-telling, to a judicial process that holds accountable those responsible for crimes committed and a process of reconciliation and reparations, a healing of the memories. It is important to emphasize the crucial role of justice in achieving sustainable peace. We often think justice as a mechanism for accountability uh, that is used to address events of the past. Even though justice has to do primarily with the past, undertaking judicial processes has all the important results that are linked to prevention. These include the deterrence of future crimes, the strengthening of reconciliation processes, and the maintenance of peace and security. All of these are consequences of justice when it is applied fairly and impartially. The question that is often asked is how to ensure a successful transitional justice process at a time when a state may be setting out to democratize public life. This is a matter of great concern for many countries, especially post-conflict countries, which must reconcile a politically violent past with the pursuit of national reconciliation and a desire to build a future premised on a peaceful coexistence of its people. However, the commitment of states to human rights, the rule of law, and a peaceful future will not be held to be credible unless the state deals with the past, addresses grievances that may have led to conflict, and puts an end to the conditions and practices that have destroyed shared values and thus perpetrate impunity. Justice must be pursued not at the detriment of human rights and rule of law, but rather to advance them. It is therefore critical for a society truly committed to advancing peace and justice, to demonstrate its unshakable commitment to creating a conducive environment 
based on appropriate legal frameworks and commits to building state structures and institutions that are legitimate, respect international human rights law and the rule of law in general, and that have the capacity to address and diffuse sources of tensions before they escalate. Every legal system, every state, has its particular institutions, its own laws and procedures, which must conform to a number of common values. In particular, an independent and impartial judiciary is the essential precondition for respect for human rights without discrimination and the fight against impunity. The judiciary must have, by law, a status that shields it from all political pressure and patronage. Remedies must be available at all levels, easily accessible and open to all citizens who consider themselves injured, whatever their political beliefs, ideology, religion, race, or property status. Ladies and gentlemen, impunity has political, juridical, and moral aspects when the offenses committed are of a serious nature. As I stated, I believe that failure to deal adequately with the past prevents peaceful coexistence between communities and constitutes a major obstacle to the evolution of democracy, which guarantees respect for human rights and the peaceful coexistence of populations. Gone are the days when the people believe in wiping the slate and starting anew. The path from conflict to peace and national reconciliation is long and full of pitfalls and requires societies to make hard choices about their future, one of them being how to tackle impunity. At the regional and international levels, we have witnessed progressive development in the quest for accountability and the fight against impunity. Perhaps, the most revolutionary aspect of the evolution of human rights and the fight against impunity has been the development of the concept of individual criminal responsibility, in which the individual has become not only the subject of human rights protection, but can also be held personally accountable for crimes that strike at the very heart of our common humanity, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, extrajudicial killings, torture, and sexual violence, among other crimes. The development of international criminal responsibility has occurred in three ways. The first is a consequence of the establishment of international criminal tribunals to prosecute violations of international humanitarian law committed in the former Yugoslavia from 1991 and in Rwanda and its neighboring states in 1994. The second is the development of the concept of universal jurisdiction, whereby states exercise jurisdictions for crimes of universal jurisdiction that were not necessarily committed in their own territories, but by their own citizens, or, the, or by their own citizens. The third, is the establishment and coming into force of the Rome Statute that established the International Criminal Court, ICC. The ad hoc tribunal, like the ICTR and ICTY, have had a significant positive impact. Today, subjecting powerful leaders and warlords to international or regional judicial accountability for crimes committed is not out of the question. Take the case of the prosecution of Hissène Abre in Senegal, for example. 20 years ago, such an act would have been simply inimaginable. That does not mean it is easy, or that justice can be achieved overnight. It, take, it can take exceptional courage and patience 
to pursue a course of justice and accountability. I'm delighted to see that the panel that follows this one includes someone who exemplifies the courage, Mrs. Claudia Paz Ipaz, former Attorney General of Guatemala. Claudia, the courage and integrity you showed in your role as Attorney General for Guatemala resonated around the world. You showed that despite incredible political opposition, it is possible to address sensitive historical cases of atrocity crimes and bring cases against former heads of state. Your leadership underline it for us just why it is so important to have an independent judiciary, one that is separate from the executive. Thanks to your support and that of the public ministry, there was considerable progress on high profile cases during 2016. Guatemala has a story of working closely with UNDP. Since 2010, UNDP's transitional justice program has supported the capacity building of justice institutions, forensic investigations, and archiving. I'm also delighted to see my brother, Mr. Toussaint Muktazini Mukimapa, Special Prosecutor for the Special Criminal Court of the Central African Republic, which will prosecute grave crimes committed since 2005. With UNDP and MINUSCA's support, the Special Criminal Court has established a transparent and competitive process for the selection of national magistrate and achieved the necessary steps to allow for the arrival of the second international magistrate. It has produced a security plan for personnel of the court and a protection strategy for witnesses and victims. A human rights mapping exercise, which was led by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and supported by UNDP and MINUSCA has identified more than 500 cases of grave human rights violations that took place during the crisis and will be used by the Special Criminal Court to prosecute perpetrators. It is critical that we continue to support this court in order to increase the Central African Republic's chance of a peaceful future. I'm glad also to see Mrs. Gordana Tadic, acting state prosecutor of the Bosnia-Herzegovina. 20 years after the Balkan War, you are still facing challenges of balancing accountability and reconciliation. Ladies and gentlemen, while I cannot exhaustively address this important subject in a few minutes, allow me to reiterate what I stated in the beginning of this address, that the in end of impunity will be achieved through the strengthening of the rule of law in all its practical aspects, whether institutional, legislative, or procedural. Further, the international community must be mobilized whenever principles of justice are systematically violated. The political transitions underway in many countries, especially in those emerging from conflict, have reaffirmed the importance of constitutional governance where the rule of law is recognized as supreme and binds the rulers and the ruled. The successful fight against impunity will require collective efforts by both international and national institutions. Countries emerging from conflict in which the warlords of yesterday transform into peacemakers of today will continue to need sustained support from the international community to ensure that such individuals are, hold, are held to account for their past actions. Doing so will help efforts to achieve true reconciliation premise on the acknowledgement of the suffering of the victims and commitment 
to the peaceful future of these communities. We can heal societies and work to break cycles of violence through credible accountability processes and mechanisms. Let us not continue to repeat the mistakes of the past. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your views on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for this moving address, for reminding us that we need to heal the past in order to move forward together in the future as society. So thank you very, very much. Um, before moving to our panel, we will watch a segment of the film Burden of Peace. The film was released in March 2015 and has been screened at more than 50 festivals worldwide, winning many awards. The film was produced by Joey Boynt and Sander Wirken. Even though the filmmakers could not join us tonight, I hope they're watching via webcast and they have expressed their gratefulness for the opportunity to present their work here. The film follows the work and accomplishments of Guatemala's first female attorney general, Claudia Paz y Paz, who we are honored to have her here tonight as one of our panelists and sitting beside her is the ambassador of Guatemala as well, so we're also grateful for his presence. The film illustrates the numerous challenges Ms. Pasipas faced when she took office. Some of them were just mentioned by Mr. Dieng, such as fighting corruption, tackling impunity, and strengthening the capacities of the justice system. After taking office, Ms. Pasipas obtained the arrest of former head of stage charged with committing genocide. Even though this film is very specific to Guatemala, the challenges that you will see in the film resonate, I think, with many of the leaders today in this room. So please, we will watch this short um, snippet and then we will go to our panel. Thank you. ¿Qué puedo hacer, Bill? Ajá, ¿por qué eso denuncia? Por amenazas. Por amenazas, igual. Con el asesor, por favor. Eh, botoncito rojo, primera ventanillas, por favor. ¿Puedo servirlo? Violencia por violencia. ¿Violencia de qué tipo? Contra la mujer. Ah, sí. Eh, hágame favor, toma este papelito, se sienta por acá, mi. Y ahorita, anda licenciada por ahí, ahorita las va a asesorar. Fue una persona que dice que le ha dicho que él puede hacer lo que él quiera, uh -huh. porque le dio una arma. Uh -huh. Pero la, la, ahorita, lo, ah, escritas. ¿Trae denuncia por escrito? Sí. Ventanilla 7, entonces. Gracias. ¿Qué puede servir? Ah, entonces, perdón. Yo vengo a poner mi denuncia. La amenazaron. Ajá, la amenazaron. El sistema de justicia no actuó como debería de actuar durante tanto tiempo. Muy bien. ¿Qué puede servir? Hay una sensación muy grande de debilidad institucional y de que el derecho penal no sirve para nada, ¿verdad? Se puede matar, se puede robar, se puede violar y el derecho no va a haber reacción estatal. Tal vez ustedes hasta acá, a 270 kilómetros de la capital, piensan o perciben que estamos muy lejos y no vemos, no crean. Hay un sistema de evaluación de desempeño que nos deja ver qué hace casi que minuto a minuto y en el SICOM casi que hora por hora. Pero en el tema de homicidios, el nivel de efectividad es... Sí, es pobre. Es pobre. Yo sé la cifra, pero no la quiero decir. ¿Dale cuánto es? Sí, el nivel de efectividad de homicidios prácticamente está a cero. Y, y debates prácticamente no han tenido todo el año. O sea cinco o cuatro debates de todo el año, realmente es pues eso nos deja muy, muy mal parados como funcionarios y yo no me sentiría bien a fin de mes recibir un salario en esas condiciones. Mi compromiso como fiscal general es cambiar la situación actual. Si no cambia acá, como ha ocurrido en otros lados, van a haber consecuencias. Hay información de 1,897 casos. En estos casos, eh, pues tenemos un total de 2,176 víctimas. No obstante, se hizo el ejercicio con 1,897 casos. En la mayoría tenemos ausencia de, de información. Y además, 
Y algo bien importante en realidad es la calidad del registro. Dentro de las variantes teníamos si el sindicado o el sospechoso estaba identificado o no. Y en muchos está desconocido. Pero si ustedes ven la forma en que está escrito desconocido en cada uno de estos rubros. O sea, ninguno es correcto. Bueno, salvo este. Y de ahí todos los demás tienen más de algún error, digamos, en la digitación. Desconocido escrito de 56 formas diferentes. Eso se los traigo a colación solo para pedirles, por favor, que la calidad de registro sea la mejor. Uno se imagina un fiscal como un policía, un varón, una persona de hierro. Era importante, no tengo que ser hombre, no tengo que ser de hierro, no tengo que gritar, no tengo que eh, imponerme con medidas poco razonables. Entonces, quizás si quedamos con eso muy claros, ¿a partir de cuándo? Y es una obligación de los compañeros que estamos aquí presentes, llenar ellos estos campos. Quedamos claros, ponemos un día de, ¿a partir de cuándo? Si quiere, a partir de mañana, ¿ya? A partir de hoy. O a partir de hoy. Va, bueno. Pero a veces me abrumo porque es, es inmenso el, el reto. Una de las razones de la violencia en Guatemala es la impunidad. No solo la impunidad de los crímenes de ahora, sino también la impunidad de lo que ocurrió durante el conflicto, durante la guerra. ¿Y los derechos humanos? Eh, los derechos humanos definitivamente es una política que favorece únicamente a los países del bloque socialista. Eh, los derechos humanos, como política, como dijo el teniente, es usada por el bloque comunista porque van tratando de ver la manera de cómo infiltrarse. Ahora, los derechos humanos, como guatemaltecos que somos nosotros, como gentes y como nuestros hermanos paisanos, que son las demás personas que han, han eh, eh, militado, Pasando otras cosas, ¿qué le parece? El Ministerio Público y la Policía Nacional Civil desmantelaron una organización que durante nueve meses, nueve meses, lavó más de 10 millones de dólares. Bueno, y esas 14 personas capturadas fueron llevadas a la torre de tribunales. Se les acusa de varios delitos. Se va desquebrajando esa pared que había que no dejaba que los casos avanzaran. Pero cada cosa, cada paso es tremendamente significativo. Que finalmente se empieza a ver, digamos, desde el Ministerio Público la persecución penal de los corruptos. Entonces, creemos que ese es el camino. La única forma que hay para desvelar la, la corrupción es denunciar, perseguir y juzgar y sentenciar. Este año el Ministerio Público superó el número de condenas. En años anteriores, en la Fiscalía de Delitos contra la Vida, registraba el 95% de impunidad. Ahora se miden un 30% de casos esclarecidos. Y es agradecer por todo el trabajo que ustedes hacen como autoridades indígenas. Más de 7.340.000 guatemaltecos están habilitados para votar el 11 de septiembre. Los eligen al nuevo presidente y vicepresidente de su país. Retired General Otto Pérez, a former Special Forces Officer and Military Intelligence Chief, is leading in the polls. No podemos ver el presente sin entender esa historia, esa historia que es una historia reciente y cuyas heridas todavía no se han terminado de cerrar. Claudia's efforts to arrest Mejia Victores 
make the military elite and political establishment nervous. Their safe haven is under siege. We meet businessman Ricardo Mendes Ruiz, one of Claudia's most outspoken critics. His father served in Rios Mont's government during the genocide. His foundation against terrorism represents the business elite and the military establishment of Rios Mont's days. Ahora, eh, se está pagando además un precio muy alto por tener a Claudia Paz y Paz ahí por esa supuesta eh, disminución en la impunidad del país. ¿Qué precio se está pagando? Un precio ideológico. Ella nos está confrontando a los guatemaltecos, ideológicamente. Si Claudia Paz y Paz no se hubiera dedicado o no hubiera dedicado gran parte de su esfuerzo a perseguir militares, hubiera contado con mucho más recursos y mucho más apoyo de la población para perseguir el crimen común. Tal vez le cae bien, te habla la vocecita así, y usted dice, pobrecita, qué chiquitita, qué gordita, qué... Pero ella no tiene la capacidad para ser fiscal general, no la tiene. Ella venía de otro mundo, de organizaciones de derechos humanos, ella no tenía experiencia. Sin embargo, ella va a tener que pagar, porque es responsable, e incluso es probable que tenga que irse a la cárcel. Tú no puedes decir, me voy a dedicar solo a aquellos casos que no van a enojar a nadie, porque yo quiero seguir siendo fiscal general. Entonces empezás porque no voy a llevar los casos de violaciones de derechos humanos porque se pueden enojar unos. No voy a llevar los casos de corrupción porque se pueden enojar los otros. No voy a llevar los casos de violencia contra la mujer porque se van a... O sea, eso no puede ser así. Si hay un caso, hay un caso. 100 las 16 horas con 5 minutos, el tribunal se encuentra constituido en esta sala de audiencias para dar a conocer su sentencia. El artículo 376 del Código Penal establece el delito de genocidio, contemplando la pena de 30 a 50 años de prisión. Las vidas humanas que se perdieron en las masacres rebasa todo nivel de entendimiento humano. Dentro de ese parámetro, los juzgadores hemos optado por imponer la pena de 50 años de prisión inconmutables y para los delitos contra los deberes de humanidad, una pena de 30 años de prisión inconmutable. de la doctora Claudia Paz y Paz en el combate frontal a la impunidad en este país y no solo a la impunidad de la guerra y del genocidio, sino a la impunidad diaria que se lleva diariamente a hombres, mujeres, jóvenes, niños y ancianos. indigenous people uh, against racism and uh, for human civilization. We believe that democracy in Guatemala 
grew last Friday. Uh, this is the first time in modern history that a domestic court has convicted a former head of state on these kinds of charges. Although convicted to 80 years imprisonment, Rios Mond only spent one night in jail. The Constitutional Court ruled that the prosecution had made a procedural error and overturned the sentence. Mont was set free. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are very much looking forward to hearing from our panel tonight, featuring Ms. Claudia Paz, Paz, Secretary for Multidimensional Security for the Organization of American States and former Attorney General of Guatemala, Mr. Muntasini Mukimapa, Special Prosecutor for the Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic, Ms. Jordana Tadic, Acting State Prosecutor from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and last but not least, as a discussion, we have Mr. Alejandro Alvarez, Director of the Rule of Law Unit from the Executive Office of the Secretary General. Alejandro will make my job easier as he will be summarizing the discussion after the, Q uh, the, the question and answer period. So with this, the biographies of the distinguished guests are in the program, so you should have them. Uh, first, we will hear from Ms. Claudia Paz y Paz. Claudia, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'd like to like to thank the International Peace Institute for hosting this event. Thank you for showing this film. I must confess, this is the first time that I see the full film. It wasn't easy for me. I know that we have a very intense agenda. Therefore, I will try and summarize two aspects that, to me, are very important. First of all, how is it possible that a country such as Guatemala, who went through 30 years of internal armed conflict, one of the bloodiest in Latin America, that produced 200,000 deaths, there were cases of torture, sexual violence, genocide. How did a country which had 99% impunity in 2006, how was it able to have a national court uh, give a sentence for genocide against the head of state? a condemnatory sentence. I think perhaps that is one of the first things we need to discuss when we, talk, when we look at the film. This was never about one person alone. You can see me in the movie, but I'm not alone. This is due to all the work, the efforts, the patience of the people who survived genocide, who even before peace was signed, began to document cases, began to exhumate bodies and to fight for access to military documentation that they brought to the Inter-American uh, Commission. It, they went to Spain to have universal jurisdiction. It's never about one person. It's an effort after decades and decades, especially by the survivors and the civil society organizations that helped them what made this possible. So when we had political will, we were able to then bring up the case. Secondly, I think that's also important to say, we're having this annual meeting and what was the role of the international community in making this possible? I'd like to mention three things that are essential for Guatemala, which helped with transitional justice. Guatemala had a presence in the United Na from the United Nations after the signing of peace, a mission that came to make sure that the peace agreements were kept, and it established a historic clearing commission, which was also supported by the United Nations, which was the very first effort to build and document and give a voice to survivors of the war. The international community of Guatemala made this possible, even though it had no jurisdiction on human rights violation case, was the presence of the CICC, the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, which opened up this space, which allowed international officials to open up the space and help us do our work. Thirdly, I cannot forget to mention the support brought by the UNDP, which supported the human rights organizations and the survivors. It supported us while we went through the exhumations and facilitated the collection of evidence that was introduced during trial. I don't want to. I don't want to take too much time. I know we don't have a lot, but when we see the last scene in the film, I had to leave. I left my position on the 14th, and one afternoon in May, I left my office and I left the country. The judge, the president of the tribunal also suffered consequences. She was sanctioned by the um, 
with the uh, attorneys. Uh, we faced spurious claims. There was a huge defamation campaign against us. And if you look back, you have to wonder about the, well, you can see it in the movie. The sentence was pronounced 10 days later. The whole trial was declared null by the Constitutional Court. So you have to ask yourself, was it worth it? So I've asked myself many, many times this in the last few years. But the answer, which also relates to today, is justice and peace. Of course, it's worth it. Of course, it was worth it. It was worth it, first of all, because of the survivors of the genocide. It was worth it because, for the first time, they were able to face the former head of state and they're in a level playing field. The person who actually ordered genocide to be committed. I do remember the words of one of the survivors who looked into his eyes and said to him, look at us. We are people. We are not beasts. I do not believe that the trial and the sentence were a way to give, give them back the citizenship that had been taken from them. As of that moment, I'm convinced that not only did their self-image change, I mean the survivors, but the perception society in Guatemala had of them also changed. If you look at the faces of the Ishilis women in the courtroom when the sentence was pronounced, people looked happy and peaceful. They, they became heroes of justice instead of victims of war in my country. Fortunately, the second reason why I believe all this was worth it is because somehow, and even if there were many other institutions created after the signing of these and there was a lot of legislation approved, well, government officials, as perhaps even in the Justice Department, were never really aware of the enormous power that we had and the things we can do to protect the rule of law if we filled our role, fulfilled our role. After this trial, I believe the prosecutors felt empowered, the judges felt empowered. So, you know, history is very paradoxical. Miguel Angel Galvez, the judge that tried Rosemont, is the judge whom two years later, he, three years later, is prosecuting former President Perez Molina for corruption and also the former vice president and half the cabinet. This is a judge. These are prosecutors who are very respected in the country. We never thought some civil servant at the prosecutor's office could become a national hero. Now the prosecutors tell me that when they're on the street, the people tell them, go forward, continue, we're with you. The uh, third reason, the third change that makes me think this whole thing was worth it uh, is that uh, I think I see an enormous and profound change in the, in the people of Guatemala. Those who have been to Guatemala know that we suffered many, many years the consequences of war. And one of these consequences was silence. We self-censored. We were not the kind of people that would come out on the streets. We were not people who would demand, as you can see here or in other countries, in this uh, hemisphere, we were not demanding our rights. And at a key moment in 2015, when it looked like we were going to go backwards, we wonder if the CICIG's mandate would be uh, renewed. It was a crucial moment. And what happened? The people of Guatemala went to the streets to demand 
justice to demand an end of impunity and to demand the end of corruption. I believe that was the biggest change. People who took justice as theirs and that finally they believe in it. So that's the end. Thank you, Claudia. Creo somos más guatemaltecos en el panel, pero me es un gran privilegio escuchar las historias y que, te, que heroes, the attorney generals have been heroes. It, you you see this this change happening. It's really um, um, very heartening. Uh, next, we turn to Africa. Mr. Montasini is a special prosecutor for the Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic. The Special Criminal Court is tasked with investigating war crimes committed in the Central African Republic. Before this post, Mr. Montasini was a renowned prosecutor of international crimes in his home country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The floor is yours. Merci, madame. Bonsoir. Uh, hello, everybody. It is an uh, honor for me to take the floor uh, after this icon of the international justice, Mrs. Claudia Passi Pass. I must say uh, that uh, seeing the film and her presentation, there are two things that uh, are important. The first is the fight against impunity cannot be uh, led by only one person. It's a fight for, for the end whole international community and the only and the other thing that i uh, you know understand from these movies that fighting against impunity fighting against the violation of human rights should not be a uh, uh, biology you know a, a theology it should be something that you live through and in order to fight uh, violations of human rights actually you need to you fighting for your Self, you buddy, you're fighting for your own survival. So there's a close link between fighting against impunity uh, after violation of human rights and development. I noticed that in my own experience in my own country and the experience of my own country, as you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a country which was ravaged by war for decades, a war that was started by a massive violation of the human rights that were documented in particular through UN reports of the mapping and other NGO reports. And it could be also characterized by a fight for power, for access, as, uh, taking the political power, because most of the leaders had to go through and uh, uh, be heard by the uh, Crime Commission to ac access the power. So it was kind of a step uh, that you need to go through in order to access the political power. And uh, unfortunately, those who were in charge of protecting people and their assets, the uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, were actually part of the problem and we're victimizing the population. And in such a context, it's a military justice, which was first called to judge, you know, uh, crimes under the Rome Statute, because until 2013, it was military justice that was uh, that had jurisdiction in this matter. But as I said earlier, it was difficult to do this work alone. Uh, actually, we had to gather all the efforts of the various uh, uh, of the judicial system and the international community, uh, uh, especially through uh, civil society organization, through training activity, uh, capacity strengthening initiatives, and also through uh, activities that allow to uh, make uh, justice more accessible and access the victims to the judicial system. And also thanks to the courage of the victims that agreed to speak out, because most victims uh, were women who had been raped and who were sub subjected to uh, sex, uh, sexual violence and uh, in fact in our culture were afraid to speak out uh, so we had to launch a number of uh, awareness campaigns to ask women to please break the silence and there was a slogan that we used to use which is break the silence before the silence breaks you and this uh, slogan was very effective because uh, more and more women started to come out and speak out and the fight against impunity uh, in really to, to these crimes under the Rome Statute uh, was done on t two paths. On 
the one hand, we wanted to strengthen the uh, judicial uh, structure on the national level. And on the other hand, we worked very closely with the uh, ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, and in the context of the complementarity, in other words, uh, the fact that the uh, national jurisdiction had a, a primacy, uh, the uh, uh, gathering of uh, various uh, international organization or uh, structures and civil society organization, the UNDP, for example, all helped us a lot to all have uh, public hearings to organize awareness campaign, to organize um, training campaign uh, so that we could train magistrates, law enforcement people, and uh, uh, jail personnel. And in the end, thanks to our uh, uh, to our partners, we managed to uh, install a priority system because you have to know that, you know, due to the uh, scope of the crime that were committed in our country, it was impossible to go after every perpetrator. So for two years, we've managed to set a number of criteria to create, uh, to prioritize and put f uh, first, uh, you know, the crime that were the most serious and remove the obstacle that prevented us from going after the authors. And with our technical and p financial partners, we managed to set those up uh, to overcome those obstacles. And the results that after one year, we managed to process uh, more than 50% of the uh, cases uh, which had been uh, lingering for several years. So this uh, system of prioritizing the uh, cases, uh, I think that in our case in my country, in Central African Republic, it's now soon we're going to start to working uh, within the context of this new uh, 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 criminal tribunal. This experience will be very important because uh, uh, there's a mapping report uh, similar to the one that was done in DRC, was just published in the uh, uh, Central African Republic and identified about 620 cases which could be considered as uh, cases uh, uh, that could be judged under the Rome Statute and the uh, law that creates the uh uh, to tribunal in the Central Africa, Africa is a, a, a law that introduced innovation in terms of complementary. This law, let me explain, uh, sets the principle that, uh, uh, that which is uh, similar to the one that is uh, uh, said in the Article 1 of the Rome Statute. The t special tribunal would not have priority in terms of uh, going after the criminals vis-a-vis -vis the ICC. The ICC, you know, has priority for, you know, uh, 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 has priority over the uh, uh, penal tribunal, and uh, that tribunal will have priority over the local jurisdiction. But this system that is set up in Central African Republic is going to work on, uh, is going to set up three uh, uh, jurisdictions in this uh, context, uh, uh, the, uh, tribunal, the ICC, the Tribunal Court, and the National Jurisdiction. So we're going to have to develop synerg synergies on all sides so that these three level of justice can have a larger uh, scope as possible, larger scope as possible, so that we can eliminate any corner of impunity that remains. It won't be easy because, as you know, my country is still characterized with a lot of inst instability. There's no central government authority, you know, exit over the, most of the population. And But we think that the political and financial support of the international community, which is already real, for uh, has been for a while and which is still real now with the initiative that we're launching today, uh, this support will be key uh, for the follow-up of the activities of the ICCs on the ground. Actually, this, uh, uh, the, the, the tribunal, uh, tribunal, uh, criminal tribunal, uh, uh, you know, corresponds to the expectation of the population. There was a national forum in Bangui in a few years ago, and the consensus uh, was forged at that time so that the justice would be rendered by this uh, special criminal tribunal. And since I've been in Bangui, May 25th, I had the time to meet all the people in the population that, uh, you know, uh, is uh, yeah, everybody uh, tell me that the justice must be rendered. They can be, uh, you know, we cannot forget about horrible crimes that be committed in my country. In conclusion, I can tell you that the special tribunal corresponds to a strong expectations of uh, from the victims in Central African Republic, and it will contribute, I'm sure, in uh, in storing a durable peace. But it won't be easy. It won't be easy because we have to overcome a number of challenges uh, in terms of collecting uh, uh, evidence. Uh, uh, on the security level, we have challenges, uh, resources challenges because of the tribunal 
tribunal court doesn't have necessarily all the means, you know, to implement its, uh, you know, its work. So first, we'll have to strengthen the capacity of the special tribunal so that this court, which is uh, 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 must also create uh, a snowballing effect on the strengthening of national jurisdictional capacity, we'll have to strengthen the means of this uh, tribunal court. We'll have to strengthen the collaboration with. Uh, uh, the civil society organization which are working where the authorities are not always present and we think that the support uh, the political and technical and financial support uh, of the donors from the international community remain key so that the special tribunal can uh, meet the expectation of the people of the Central African Republic and I think that this opportunity which is given to us today to uh, present in this case for the uh, uh, ICC is really uh, uh, welcome and perfect. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I, I like the slogan you mentioned, break the silence before the silence breaks you. Um, that's, uh, I think that can be applied in many contexts. Next, um, we turn to um, Ms. Gordana Tadic. Acting State Prosecutor of Bosnia and Herzegovina. As mentioned by Mr. Adama Lien, after 20 years of the war, Bosnia and Herzegovina is still in the process of healing its past. So, welcome to IPI. We're so glad you have joined us. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, fellow prosecutors, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you, th give thanks to the, uh, the organizer of the conference for the invitation and the opportunity to give my contribution uh, to this discussion about this very important topic, the tackling impunity to sustain peace in such an important, on such an important uh, meeting. The documentary that we've just seen gives us a special uh, insight into how the rule of law uh, has to become uh, the uh, foundation of the development of every UN member country. And it is uh, our task, which is not easy at all, can be co accomplished only in case when all of the structures of the system uh, function as one. The culture of impunity has to uh, end in all countries, and that can be done only if the judiciary is completely impartial uh, in its uh, work. Bosnia and Bosnia and Herzegovina has been a member of the United Nations since 1992, and in the future uh, we expect uh, to um, uh, say to the uh, un uh, European Union uh, we are already at its uh, borders. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a country that was affected uh, by war uh, that lasted from 1992 to 1995. Uh, due to this war, a large number of population uh, was uh, killed and uh, around uh, 700,000 people are still missing and are still searched for. A large number of uh, criminal offenses against international humanitarian law, uh, such as war crimes, uh, have been committed, uh, and that includes a large number of uh, criminal uh, cases with elements of sexual violence. Uh, many uh, families um, have been display were displaced, but in besides all of this, even 22 years after uh, the war, the population of Bosnia and Herzegovina um, uh, desire peace, stability, and safety. And uh, we are all responsible uh, for this, uh, all of us in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in the region, Europe, and the whole world. And we all have to contribute, um, give our contribution uh, to accomplish this goal and uh, to, uh, to prevent any conflicts in the future. And this uh, goal, uh, from the aspect of the Prosecutor's Office of Bosnia and Herzegovina, can be achieved uh, by a fast uh, processing of uh, war crime cases. Unfortunately, during the war, a large number of uh, crimes uh, was committed. Uh, the Prosecutor's Office in Bosnia and Herzegovina has 59 prosecutors, and about half of them work on these kinds of cases. And the uh, prosecutors... Um, were trained in this area, and so far around 700 individuals uh, have been charged. Uh, we have completed the most complex uh, cases uh, of Category 2, which we have uh, taken over from the Hague Tribunal. But uh, despite all of this, uh, there's still a large number of unresolved cases. Uh, the cases of war crimes in Bosnia and Herzegovina are being uh, handled in accordance uh, with the provisions of the law on uh, uh, criminal proceedings and the uh, Criminal Code of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Criminal Code and the National war uh, crime strategy. 
besides the prosecutor's office, uh, the important uh, contribution in resolving these kinds of uh, cases um, was given by the High Judiciary and Prosecutorial Council and uh, the, uh, primarily through the IPA funds, uh, which uh, enabled, which allowed for increase in the number of prosecutors and the staff that worked on these uh, cases, and they provided material support um, to the prosecutor's office and all courts and prosecutors, uh, prosecutors in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in all parts of uh, Bosnia Federation, uh, Republika Srpska and the Bečko district, uh, and they were, gave the support to. Um, for the all judicial institutions at all levels become uh, trained of, uh, to be able to work on these kinds of cases. It is also to point out that o, uh, OSCE uh, is also monitoring the work on these cases and it gives its uh, contribution to uh, promoting these kinds of cases and um, uh, dealing with obstacles. And currently working on the national war crime uh, strategies uh, e, uh, to streamline uh, the uh, cases towards the county and cantonal uh, prosecutor's offices. Uh, it is uh, the the largest number of the cases is considered in the in the prosecutor's of of the of the national uh, national office, and that is one of the ways in which uh, to uh, prevent impunity uh, in the war crimes area. Uh, besides this, the impunity in this uh, area can be avoided only with a good regional cooperation between, between Bosnia and Herzegovina and the other countries in the region. For uh, 13 years, the prosecutor's office of Bosnia and Herzegovina has been the generator of regional uh, cooperation in uh, criminally prosecuting the perpetrators of war crimes. Uh, in uh, about 20 million people in the Balkan regions, uh, in the Balkan region speaks. Uh, very similar languages and a large number of uh, suspects uh, and, or uh, perpetrators or that have been indicted are in those neighboring countries, which actually prevents their, their uh, bringing them before justice in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We will work uh, towards it that all, the, all perpetrators of war crimes are, should be processed and that it is, they should not be allowed that they, are, that they hide from, from justice. Besides this, um, there are numerous witnesses and other victims that were affected by the war crimes um, uh, and uh, because of them uh, the um, it is not possible to extradite some of uh, these perpetrators because they have a dual citizenship, for example. Uh, for this uh, reason, uh, we invite our colleagues from uh, the region uh, to uh, seriously deal with this uh, problem in, avoid, in order to avoid impunity and primarily uh, to uh, have, because of our responsibility towards the victims of war crimes. Uh, work by, by working together with other countries in the world, uh, we have uh, managed uh, to um, get uh, perpetrators in front of different countries uh, who they were hiding different countries like in Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, the United States, Switzerland, etc. Uh, we managed to get this done and this actually significantly contributes uh, to strengthening of the rule of law and the confidence of the people that the, people, that the citizens have in the, the judicial institutions um, and the pol as well as the police agencies. The prosecutor's office, uh, in order to uh, improve the regional cooperation and to uh, prevent impunity, uh, went into uh, the protocol agreement protocols uh, with regard uh, to a criminal prosecution uh, of uh, criminal war crimes with countries uh, such as the Republic of Croatia, Serbia, and Monteneg Montenegro. And each of uh, these uh, countries. Um, uh, works uh, on these uh, on these cases according to their le uh, legal statutes. The the prosecutors of the Bosnia and Herzegovina is always uh, ready to help uh, our colleagues from the region uh, to finalize uh, to complete uh, certain cases, uh, but also to take over the cases that it has jurisdiction over. Uh, the prosecutor's office uh, accepted all legal standards of the Hague Tribunal, and we have an exceptionally good uh, cooperation with the, uh, prosecu uh, with the prosecutor's office of the International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia, and, uh, and uh, the main prosecutor, Sergio Bramertz. Uh, the uh, uh, prosecutor's office accepted the facts determined by the Hague Tri Tribunal uh, with regards to the war crimes, uh, it, uh, but this does doesn't mean uh, this is not an obstacle for the countries that do not accept these countries not uh, to uh, work on those cases. They, they could 
uh, they could uh, uh, work according to the positive uh, regulations of their of uh, of their own, and in that way, uh, and in the way. I have to point out that we had very positive examples of this cooperation. There is cooperation, but there have been some obstacles and delays. Uh, a significant contribution uh, to this uh, project of regional uh, cooperation uh, between Bosnia and Croatia, Serbia and Montegre Montenegro uh, was uh, given uh, by UNDP. Um, the project uh, refers to strengthening the rule of law and uh, fight against impunity for war crimes, uh, especially those with transnational effects. Through this uh, efficient regional cooperation between the prosecutor's offices and institutions uh, that uh, search for missing persons, we are focusing on the dialogue with the goal to um, uh, with, with the goal to uh, go over obstacles that uh, that uh, come from uh, different national legal frameworks, and uh, we are also for better. Um, conditions uh, to uh, have to have better access uh, to justice and also uh, to uh, be able to establish uh, systems uh, to exchange information between the prosecutor's office um, the uh, state institutions that have mandate to look for uh, to search for the missing pieces our job will not end uh, until until all of the cases and all of the perpetrators have been uh, put to, uh, have been uh, have gotten a verdict, this is our debt uh, to uh, to our future generations, uh, and we want them to live in peace and know the truth about their past. I would like to point out that the dedication of the prosecutor's office in resolving uh, war crimes and searching for missing persons, as well as the uh, very successful cooperation uh, between uh, with all of the subjects of international. Uh, community. After uh, this very stimulating presentation, we now have time for the uh, brief discussion with the audience. Um, who would like to start the conversation? We have my colleagues who have uh, the microphones, and they can, if you raise your hands, we can start off the QA session. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this amazing panel and for all the interventions. My name is Ana Grasa. I work with UNDP in the rule of law team. And my question um, is directed to Prosecutor Mutanzini um, and a little bit about you know, the future of the Special Criminal Court in CAR, but mostly in regards to how you know, the UN and international partners can support a national court that is you know, responsible also for trying serious cases, but at the same time, uh, what is the impact that you know, drawing the attention on this mechanism has in regards to the rest of the rule of law and access to justice for the population and basically on the rest of the national court system? Um, I hope that's okay. And sorry, my French is not good enough to do this in French, but uh, merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, on, in the back. Um, I, my name is Sophia. I'm from the team of experts on sexual violence in conflict. And I, th um, I know that the role played by um, Claudia and by Colonel Mutanzini has been extraordinary um, in terms of sexual violence in conflict. Um, uh, uh, Claudia, thanks to Claudia, we have a landmark decision on this issue. And I would like to ask them specifically what made the decision possible and what allowed the victims to come forward and to participate in the proceedings since it's a crime that is attached with a very high stigma and it's usually very difficult to prosecute and usually prosecutors are shy to come for the case because it's a very difficult charge to prove. Thank you. Is there another question before we go back to the panel? There's one here. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Dr. Daniele. Uh, actually, the question can be picked by anyone since I've worked in most of these 
cases or related. Uh, you're really talking about uh, generational justice. You're talking about justice for at least two generations in Guatemala. And I'm not sure in the car, I know the ICC Bemba case. That, but um, and certainly in Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, how would justice serve the young generation, the f future generations, in your estimation, including the failure, so to speak, in the Guatemala case? Uh, take that from there. We might want to discuss it further. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Claudia, would you like to start? I believe, I totally agree, that if we don't focus on it properly, if we don't approach, approach it properly, it would be very difficult to bring to trial these sexual violence crimes. In Guatemala, that's what happened. Even though there were very few human rights cases that had moved forward, there were none none which reflected or charged properly sexual violence cases. So what we did took a long time. We supported the survivors. This took a long time. We worked with the attorney, human rights attorneys. We worked with the officers in the justice systems. We did investigations to understand why the cases weren't reflected properly. And we found at the time, uh, contrary to belief, is not that survivors did not tell the story of their sexual violent crimes they had been, that they had suffered, but rather the human rights attorneys, the prosecutors, and the judges were not listening. It took a lot of effort to make people properly aware so that the cases would be heard. Also, there was some psychosocial support for survivors so they could prepare to be prepared to testify. I do remember a key moment in a genocide case when women that survived, there were 10 survivors who were going to testify. We were really concerned because we had asked for this to be in, done in a closed co courtroom, but the court told us that they needed to testify in public because all other witnesses have testified in public, so they have to do so as well. So the discussion was, would they go, should they not go, what should we do? The family, don't they, they didn't know they were going to testify, they didn't know they suffered sexual violence, the communities don't know, so this would be uh, more victimization. But I remember one of our colleagues said, so why don't we ask them themselves? So we did, we asked them, and they, they testified. They did not testify alone. But the very first rows in the courtroom, there were other women there with them so that they would not feel alone at that very, very difficult moment. They were there so that they could support them. And I can tell you that at that moment during the trial, things changed. Because we heard the survivors and those who listened, those, the people who listened, who were hearing them, felt empathy and were moved by their testimony. Up to that point, the media had not really covered the cases. But as of that point, they did. The testimony was published in all national and international press. Now, what was the other question? What's, um, what about the next generation? Correct? So, I haven't been to Guatemala so much lately, but what I've been reading and what I can see from here is that there's a 
uh, re uh, there's a re-emergence of organization of young people uh, for justice against corruption, against impunity, uh, in, uh, pro of uh, constitutional reform. And it's a historical time during all the demonstrations in 2013 in Guatemala. And this is, uh, we hadn't seen this before, but the three biggest university joined in this march. So I think we have hope in Guatemala, in the young generations that they are also claiming, clamoring for justice. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mr. Montesini. Merci, madame. Uh, merci, ma thank you very much. I received a first question from Mrs. Ana Glacia, who about the future of the special criminal court, uh, what type of support this court can benefit from so that it can advance, and finally, what would be the impact of this special court on the, uh, on the Central African uh, judiciary system? I must say, to start, that the Special Criminal Court is a profound will of the Central African people. Uh, it was held in Bangui in 2015. There was a forum, a national forum, that grouped all the uh, civil society of Central Africa, including the armed forces. And this forum uh, was uh, following consultations at the base. And uh, from this forum, uh, the will of the uh, Central African population was shown, uh, their will to judge and not give amnesty the crimes of war, uh, genocide, and crimes against humanity. So there's a strong will of the Central African people uh, to fight against impunity of these crimes. This will, political will, of the Central African population has been uh, supported by the international community because engagements have been taken between the United Nations and the Central African government that finally ended up in the creation of the Special Criminal Court. And as I s mentioned before, this Special Court uh, with the will of the uh, Central African legislature has three different jurisdictions in the same space. The International Penal uh, Court, uh, then the Special Court that uh, does not have the exclusivity uh, but, but who is, has a priority. That means that there's going to be uh, the international uh, criminal court that is going to support the national jurisdictions and the special court as well as the special court that will uh, include the national jurisdictions. I can give a simple example. Uh, the, organizations are going made for the special court and uh, these uh, special organizations will be integrated. We are going to associate these organizations, Central African magistrates, as well as ordinary uh, courts so that they can benefit from this training. And this will be structured trainings organized by the CPI, by the ICC, first in Central Africa and then uh, in the International Criminal Court. The impact also of the special penal court uh, in the Central African jurisdiction system is will be that it will promote equitable uh, trials. For example, it prohibits uh, the provision of capital punishment. Of course, Central Africa uh, has a moratorium on capital punishment, but it hasn't completely abolished capital punishment. And with the practice of the special court, this can motivate legislative reforms that can lead to the abolition of uh, capital punishment. All the principles that are going to be put in place for equitable uh, trials under the protection of victims and witnesses, uh, the collection of proof, all of these systems will finally will be a legacy for the Central African judiciary system. And so that the special court can uh, accomplish this immense task, the political uh, support of the Central African government, but also the international court represented by the United Nations is very important. So uh, political support as well as financial support, because for at the time being, for instance, we know that the special criminal court uh, 
benefits uh, of uh, 14 months of financing, uh, well, and its mandate is of five years. So we need, so we need uh, uh, financial support, su uh, supplementary financial support for this uh, special court, given the important role that this court is going to play, not only to fight against impunity, but also to improve uh, justice services in Central Africa. So this is what the special court is expecting, uh, a political, uh, political and financial support. I, I will also add, that the special criminal court will need uh, human resources uh, support because at this moment there are not many resources and we have only been able to select a reduced number of magistrates. But as you well know, we need to we're we need to treat more than 620 cases since 2003. At this moment, we only have four magistrates to deal with this, so it's not enough. So we hope that with additional financing, it will be possible to increase the number of human resources for the Special Criminal Court. Mrs. Uh, Sofia asked me a question on the experience of the DRC concerning the fight against sexual violence. What uh, has allowed victims to uh, speak, uh, to express themselves? Uh, she was in Congo, so she might remember all the campaigns that all the civil or society organizations uh, made uh, the, with the UNDP. All these uh, sensibilization campaigns uh, towards victims. I, uh, I uh, resumed this earlier uh, with a slogan, so to break silence before silence breaks you. Because in our culture, it is not easy for a victim to talk about rape. Because right away, she's stigmatized. She is rejected by the community. So it was important to explain to victims that if they didn't talk, uh, they would continue to be victimized. And there would be more victims without talking about the possibility of contagious STDs. And that campaign was a success because partly we uh, put in place protection mechanisms for these victims. It was necessary to use uh, civil society organizations to approach victims, to organize them in uh, associations. Uh, and to explain them what their legal rights and also to give them access to justice because we create jurisdictions that could uh, go uh, mobile, do mobile auditions, uh, reach the victims. And the victims who thought that military could never be judged when they saw that officers could be judged and sentenced to strong uh, punishments, the victims started to believe in justice and they started to talk. Also, something that helped us was that given the difficulty of uh, proof in uh, sexual matters, we systematically used uh, the word of the victim against the word of the perpetrator uh, when it was not possible to do otherwise. So in certain cases, if by evaluating the credibility of the deposition of the victim, even if there was only one witness, only her witness, it, the judge uh, condemned the perpetrator to uh, strong uh, penalties. So these are the activities that have allowed us to advance the cause of the victims, in particular in the fight against sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Yes, yes, Mr. Mr. Vick, you have the floor. Ovo drugo pitanje vezano za generacijsku pravdu odnoslo se čini se na sve paneliste pa bi uh, yeah, we I, I would like to uh, clear up some, some things about Bosnia and Herzegovina. As I mentioned, um, we had a lot of um, war crimes on our docket and we still have them. And in those cases, a lot of cases uh, had elements of sexual um, violence. We have a lot of experience because in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, there is a organization that is uh, collecting the, the victims of the sexual violence. And we have a very specific situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina because we don't look at the uh, nationality of who is a victim and who is uh, the perpetrator. And it's the only way 
by treating everybody equally, we are getting the results and we have obtained the trust of all the victims so that we are now able to fight and uh, realize the justice for the whole generation that has to keep on going and the stays uh, as a legacy for our children. So we have a huge experience in that area. We have a system of uh, uh, support uh, for the victims and for the uh, witnesses. And we have civil organizations that are educating the victims and the uh, witnesses how to prepare their statements. So I have to reiterate, we really have a huge experience. We still have cases that even today there are uh, victims coming out reporting the sexual violence and it turns out that these victims were coming up earlier many times but nobody believed them uh, because sometimes when they were in um, in camps in uh, sort of a war camps and they weren't able to speak because they had husbands alive but when husbands died then they were free to come and admit that they were raped. So we have obtained a very high level of trust of the victims, and that can only happen if you have an organization that is going to mobilize the victims and give them full support how to express themselves and teach them how to do that. Especially women uh, who have been sexually, uh, or anybody who has been sexually violated, they need to get a lot of support um, in order to come uh, forth and help the prosecutor um, pursue the case and also to come as witnesses in the cases. The second thing that we do is um, exhumation because the prosecutorial office of Bosnia and Herzegovina is the only one allowed that can um, look for people who were missing, who are considered missing. We can look for them by exhumating remains. And uh, we are the only ones that are able to uh, do that. And every person that has been found is also a recipient of the generational justice and a part of creating peace and forgiveness among the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Aside from that, we are working on other areas, how to find the missing pe persons. Uh, together with other countries in the region, uh, getting the information, trying to find a mass uh, graves and to dig them out. We have a very specific situation and that is actually um, revision of the bones because in Bosnia and Herzegovina we have 11 um, uh, organizations that collect bones and they are looking via DNA with the Institute for the Missing Persons in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, they work together and also uh, the other people missing from the other countries in the re region. And by analyzing um, DNK analysis, we are able to find whether some of the people that are missing, that they are actually, um, their bones are actually collected in these institutions that collect bones. Considering the amount of people who are considered missing, uh, and that is 7,000 people still considered missing in Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though a lot of them have been found, we consider that this is a very important way how to speed up the process uh, and how to achieve that generational justice and how to create the peace among the future generations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I can tell you that um, the judicial system that we have, a complete judicial system, is in a good way to succeed. And to conclude, before uh, the drinks and the reception, we have Alejandro who has the um, challenging task to summarize in a very brief manner the very rich and fruitful discussion we've had tonight. <laughs> so Alejandro, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jimena, and uh, thank you very much for uh, you know IPI and UNDP as well for inviting me here today. Um, I mean, the first thing that I would like to say is that I think and I hope that you recognize 
that the people that we have here in this panel today is very special people. Uh, and uh, I mean, they are making history. And they are advancing humanity. So uh, I, I hope that you, know, you also uh, feel that you have been invited here to New York, to uh, New York, to UN headquarters as well, as, uh, as a recognition of your work, of your commitment, of your bravery, of, of, of uh, your long-term, uh, I mean, lifelong, I would say, commitment to justice and to all of us. So thank you very much for that to you three. Uh, and actually, that makes, me, that makes you know, my first point about this, which is that people matter. Um, because you know, the three people that we have here today, I mean, they are not just prosecutors or they did their job. Uh, actually, you know, by doing their jobs, they receive calls from political leaders. They've been uh, insulted by the press. They have been, uh, you know, threatened by many people. Uh, they had to manage their own fears and their families' fears. So uh, it's not, you know, uh, it's not, I mean, you know, we recognize very much your speeches here, but, you know, it's your, uh, your life experience, your dedication, that I would say is uh, the most interesting thing that, you know, we are uh, witnessing today. So... Thank you very much for that. Um, then I think that you know we learned you know a number of things you know today uh, uh, this evening um, that I will try to you know put some kind of a order to. But uh, I, I think uh, by talking about generation and justice, or you know doing justice for the different generations. Uh, I think that we what we what we are hearing here uh, that you know their work has not been about you know convicting people or investigating you know a, a crimes against humanity. Uh, what they triggered is, is is a profound change in the way that their own societies work or have been working. It's about culture. It's about the way how uh, people uh, relate to each other. It's about truth. It's about impunity. Uh, so, um, you know, beyond the story of, uh, of these convictions for crimes against humanity, genocide, is how much these cases impact the politics and the culture. Uh, and I would say that this is, uh, you know, we haven't finished to see the impact of this work. It's maybe just the beginning. Well, truth is as well that you know the story that they are telling is not a story that happened overnight or in just in two years or three years. It's been the work of you know many many people for many many years, decades. And this is the challenge for us that you know it's in in this era of you know I want it right now. It has to happen right now. It's very difficult to manage, you know, those expectations with actually a societal change that goes beyond a generation and takes a lot of time. But we need to stick to it. We need to, to stick to it because the contribution of this work for their countries, for humanity as all, well, is much greater than the case. It's much greater of our even lifetime, if you wish. So other than the people, it's also what is the type of, or the character of change that this work uh, brings. And then it was mentioned, I think, by Adama Dieng, you know, at the beginning, but also by the panelists, that dealing with the past is actually preventing the future, um, prevent, preventing the crimes, you know, to happen again. And this is, if you wish, the mantra of the new Secretary General. And this is why this work is so important for him, this type of, uh, uh, of engagement 
is so important for overall the human rights, the rule of law agenda of the United Nations and uh, its member states. Uh, and uh, this is why I think you know, he commits so much uh, for this work as we move forward. And, uh, and I would like to also, you know, maybe uh, I'll, uh, point out about the role of international actors uh, that we are um, highlighted by colleagues. Um, many of you mentioned the role of UN missions. Others mentioned the role of international tribunals. Uh, but we also uh, we heard as well about the Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic, which is a national court with international uh, uh, prosecutors and judges. Uh, we also heard about the CICIG, which is a pro an international prosecutor office uh, investigating and, and, and uh, 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 indicting under national law. Uh, and uh, obviously the challenge that you know, uh, colleagues in the Balkans you know, have been uh, already dealing with, but now with the closure of the uh, ICTY uh, at the end of this year, it's going to become you know, even more important. And uh, uh, Ms. Tadic uh, mentioned the importance of cooperation amongst you know, the countries of the region. So the question is, and I'm, you know, I'm reflecting on that because as we move forward, we are going to have to deal with the cases of Yemen, Iraq, Syria, DRC, Mali, Venezuela, you name it. So we are going to have to do this right. Uh, because it's not that you know, this, this is totally cheap, right? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of political effort. It's many, many, many years of engagement. Uh, and for that, we need a lot of you know, stars aligned. So I don't know how we are going to do that, actually. <laughs> but the point is, in any case, that you know, this community, these people, uh, the victims, uh, the United Nations, hopefully, and the international community overall, we certainly need to stick together because there is so much work still to do to achieve the challenge, to achieve the changes that these people achieve for their own countries. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Please, on behalf of IPI and UNDP, we would like to sincerely thank you all for this great insights shared this evening. Please stay with us. There are drinks. We have a lovely terrace. So uh, um, join us in this part of the conversation. And I will also just like to acknowledge Leah Christie from UNDP for uh, organizing this event and Amanda from IPI. Thank you very much.